Hello everyone and welcome for another video of Love and War Games. In this video, we're going to have a 1000 points battle between the Crown and the Alliance. Uh, this is going to be the first uh, battle that we have for the second season. We will talk about the narrative a little bit in a second. Uh, it was supposed to be a 2000 points battle, but I'm a little bit sick, so you might see me making big tactical mistakes today. But we wanted to play it anyway, and we have uh, this beautiful, beautiful table with a lot of uh, terrain from Steve that he made himself. And uh, this is going to be the first time we play on a tropical, tropical uh, island, like map. And uh, really, I think it's going to be a pleasure to play on this map. Uh, before we have a look at the list and the scenario, let's talk a little bit about the narrative that caused this battle. It has been more than a year since the appearance of the two emergence points, one in Northern Atlantic and one in Southern Pacific. These antipodal positions are, through arcane science, connected through a vortex, similar to the Order's portals, but at a much larger scale, entire battle fleets can enter one vortex and appear at the other within minutes. The Vortex Alpha appeared immediately surrounded by vast amounts of icy islands and frozen glaciers. The Great Powers, after sending some reconnaissance ships, quickly began a war of conquest and colonization. Every single faction tried to conquer what became known as the Archipelago Alpha, with the Commonwealth being the most successful of them all. However, the leader of the Commonwealth force eventually allied with other factions, especially the multinational task force Mordred, and consolidated its position in the archipelago until it was strong enough to declare its independence. On the first anniversary of the Emergence Points conflict, Archipelago Alpha was, mostly, under the control of the newly independent White Fleet and Task Force Mordred, with multiple other nations, mostly the Imperium, the Crown and the Commonwealth, fighting to claim more territories. The situation was quite different for Vortex Omega. Far south of from Australia, and without any land around, it was very difficult for the great powers to secure this area. It did not prevent several factions to fight for control, especially the Empire, which was the first nation to ever send a fleet through the Vortex, as well as the Crown, the Sultanate, and the Covenant. However, these were mostly skirmishes and fleet actions, not like the wars of conquest in Northern Atlantic. This changed on the precise day of the first anniversary of the appearance of the Emergence Points. A new series of massive tsunami-inducing underwater earthquakes heralded the appearance of what would eventually be known as the Archipelago Omega. Similarly to Antarctica or Hook's Reach, these highlands exhibited evidence of hyper-evolutionary life forms, with thick and dangerous jungles already present when the first recon aircrafts arrived. The first ones to react were those already in control of Vortex Alpha. Task Force Mordred sent an expedition, composed mostly of Canadian ships, through the Vortex into Archipelago Omega. They immediately started to establish small outposts and fortified naval stations around, mostly at their main island of Outpost S1. They hoped they'd have time to dig in before other great powers would learn of this place. They were wrong. What they had not anticipated was that the Latin Alliance already had a large force on its way to Vortex Omega, even before the archipelago appeared. After the destruction of the entire French Flotte des Braves in Northern Atlantic, a retaliation force was assembled in South America and sent to Omega. Its objective was to appear in the belly of the beast, directly at Vortex Alpha, and attack the heart of the White Flotilla. When Salazar, the Ad Alliance Admiral, got reports that a large set of unknown islands had appeared and that a task force mortar expedition was fortifying the region. He knew he had to act fast, lest their enemies would control both ends of the vortex. Aboard his powerful Virginia-class battleship and escorted by several Equier and Springfield frigates, as well as a large squadron of Chevalier cruisers and a Saratoga, Admiral Salazar charged through hoping to deal a decisive blow to Task Force Mordred. In front of this battle formation were the disorganized ranks of a surprise Task Force Mordred, with only the expedition's two Toronto cruisers and their escorting Halifax Shield cruiser to hold the line. A nearby patrol of Orca hunter submarines were rushing to the rescue, while a pair of Saxon and Tintagel airships 
also flew in at full speed to intercept the Alliance force. Not far, the expedition's leader aboard his Protector-class command submarine and its escorting orcas also moved full steam ahead to engage in the battle, even if he knew he'd arrive after the battle would be joined. Would Task Force Mordred manage to gather enough forces to hold the line and protect the Vortex Omega? Or would the Alliance break through this defensive perimeter and win a decisive victory in this first battle for the Archipelago Omega? And now that we have seen the narrative context for this first battle, a bit long, sorry, we need to establish the beginning of the second season, let's now have a look at the fleets that are on the table today. So we are going to play on this map for this uh, battle, and uh, we are going to play for the first time the Tempest scenario, which means that the, anything within 12 inches of the center of the map uh, when it activates within 12 inches of the center, which is this little elephant there, is going to uh, take a critical damage, and all the drifts are doubled for the duration of the game. Uh, kind of like the same as for the fog, there is a chance every turn, uh, starting on turn 2, that the Tempest will stop. Now, which fleets did we come with? Uh, I came with a Canadian force, mostly, uh, first, I put my aerial units here, so I have one Tintagel and two Saxon, and some um, SRS token because they look nice here. Then we continue, and let's just appreciate the terrain all around, like, wow. Let's continue a little bit here. I'm going to have the two Toronto control cruisers there, as well as an Halifax that is going to be attached to the Toronto. These are going to be my main anchor, and there is a lot of guys in front of them, so it's, they are not feeling very safe. I have three orcas there with a little firing line in case the enemy starts to approach. And my second battle fleet, still hidden, is going to be an unexpected arrival. I have this HMC Saskatchewan, I think, uh, with two attached orcas, and they are in unexpected arrival. And the uh, main protector, like the submarine, Aircraft carrier is going to shoot at full potential on turn 2 when it arrives and can also send its SRS token. Now that we've seen the Crown Forces, let's have a look at the Alliance. Donc, aujourd'hui, on fait un petit mix dans le sens où on va être sur une full battle fleet Susa avec forcément un Virginia, donc uh, Itlands. Il te lance aussi, bon, il ouais, faudra que je la change. Et il te lance partout. Il te lance partout, littéralement. Avec, pour le coup, des assauts Terminator. Avec. Donc, euh, il sera accompagné de ses quatre escorteurs. Mm -hmm. Et rien que lui, ça va. Bien. Un petit Saratoga derrière avec il te lance et lance torpille. Et là aussi, euh, du Terminator assaut parce que, voilà, parce pourquoi que pas. Bien. Parce que c'est cool, parce que c'est beau. <rire> Avec euh, quatre petits écuyers qui sont là. Ok. Quatre euh, petits Springfield de corvettes très sympas à monter, très, très sympa à peindre. Et pour finir, trois chevaliers, double euh, la, fi la, fi la finesse, la poésie, <rire> la poésie de, 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 du barbecue. So this is going to be uh, the fleets for today. And just we wanted to say that now we really feel at home in the Majestic. They changed a little bit the whole area where we play. And now there is a little map of dystopian wars right here. So yeah, we feel at home here. So we've seen what are going to be the forces here. Now let's start for the beginning of the first turn. First activation, the Springfields went forward, but they didn't have anything in range. And then I moved forward a little bit my Orcas, who are all going to shoot on this Springfield on the left. It's going to be 17 dice, thanks to Pack Hunter, and all these dice there are for the defenses between their friends and escort duties everywhere. So that's going to be quite useful for them. So 17 dice, three explosives, another explosive, and that's going to be it. Let's have a look at the defense roll. Minus five, but I still think that the poor, the poor Springfield pops out. It had a citadel of ten. Yeah, it's really, really dead. Boom. The vengeance of the French. The Ecuyer are riding the wave of the tempest, and they are going to shoot on the Halifax here. It's going to be fourteen dice, but 
ablative uh, front uh, armor means that two explosives will not be re-rolled. Uh, do I want to use some... Uh, I, actually, I am going to use three generator points, uh, maybe even four, let's say, uh, because this way, statistically, it should not make me a critical damage. I have only two guardian points left. So, ten dices. Thank you for the ablative uh, front armor. That is going to be ten, and indeed, that is only going to be one point of damage. Uh, probably the ablative uh, front armor saved me from uh, getting a critical. Next activation, to gain some time, my Tintagel moved forward and shot on the Springfield all the way on the right. The funny thing is like the Torpedo Salvo did nothing, I did one hit uh, for seven dices, and then I had five dices <laughs> for the rocket, and I had this roll, which is like once in a month, if you play every day, you will have this. And it has been absolutely obliterated. Well done. Next big activation, the Columbia is charging forward, reckless of the storm, and he's at closing range and putting all its weapon, its two frontal rocket batteries and its two uh, heat lances are all going on this Halifax. I use the last two Guardian generator points to remove two dices, but it's still going to be a lot. I still count, though, with the um, ablative front armor. Eh ben merci, l'ablative. Uh, it still hurts a lot. And with the critical, it was a magazine explosion, meaning that the Halifax is crippled and the two Torontos start to take damage. That is sad indeed, and uh, it's starting to be a little bit hot for the crown. Okay, I will activate now those units before they get too bad. Uh, I will use a full uh, reverse so they don't get in range of the Terminator Assault on turn 2, so they will all get a disorder. Uh, what's going to happen is I'm going to link the forward rocket batteries to try to clean out the escorts there, and as well some torpedoes for the Springfield there. I'm really trying to soften them up for the air attack that will happen next turn. After all this firepower, let's remember that it's about almost 500 points, I managed to sink one Écuyère and one Springfield, and it was quite close actually, I barely killed the Écuyère. Uh, not so great, uh, but yeah, let's uh, see what happens next. And I'm almost out of activation, but now the big French ships are going to activate. Next activations, the Saratoga moved forward and it shot and didn't do even one single point of damage on the Toronto. And these two Saxons sent everything, all the rockets, all the torpedoes on the Springfield, barely managing to get one point of damage. A little bit underwhelmed for now by the British aircraft, but such is the life. We are going to go now for the last activation of the turn, which is going to be the three Chevaliers. Okay, first firing of the Chevalier. Two ships are going to link everything with coordinated support on this poor Halifax. So the four heat lances with all their torpedoes, it's going to be all these dices with devastating and hazardous, even at long range. So imagine what it does at closer range. And yeah, that is going to hurt the poor Halifax. Let's see how this rolls. Okay, that hurts. Yeah, the Chevalier absolutely obliterated the Halifax that used to be here, so it's destroyed, but only managed, the third Chevalier managed to do only one whole point of damage uh, on the Toronto, thanks to Ablative Pro Armor. This is going to be the end of the first turn, but before the end, I am looking for this magical explosive so I can bring my main uh, flagship already. Let's hope. Ah, oh, it was so close, it was right there, but no, it will come at the beginning of the next turn. Beginning of the second turn, the crown got the initiative and I activated those guys first before they die from all of this. Uh, they did again break, uh, so they uh, take a disorder and they stay where they are. I'm gonna link all the rocket batteries on the one of the Chevalier and all the torpedoes on the Saratoga because the Chevalier have reinforced waterline. You will notice 
that I put all my units, like uh, all my stack of snowbirds, which is the capacity of the Canadian battle fleet. So turn two and turn four, I will have a stack of uh, SRS, depending on how many units I have left alive. Uh, turn four, there might not be that many people left anymore. I uh, will see, but this is already going to help. Uh, we will do the shooting and see at the end what happened. Okay, first alliance roll for this game, uh, for this second turn. The Equier went here, made a combined attack on the Halifax with a card for minus one Citadel. And they did manage to do two points of damage and a generator offline, which uh, doesn't affect much the Guardian generator. But still, I take the marker and I go to the red. All right, the Tintagel put all its firepower on the last Springfield, sinking it. And in response, the Chevalier went here and absolutely obliterated one of the Toronto command cruiser with double citadel, like easily. Eh. Uh, okay, now we will try to survive. And now a small activation for the crown, but still good. These two Saxons went here on the flank and shot on the Saratoga. All their rockets doing one hull point and then all their torpedoes doing another hull point. And now the Saratoga is crippled. And uh, it's starting to be quite difficult for the crown. Uh, my orcas that were uh, here decided to make some move and come there. Uh, if I stayed on the left, they would be obliterated later. The target is not perfect because it's going to be this crippled Chevalier, which has reinforced waterline. But at least I'll be a little bit protected from the Virginia. It's going to be 20 dices, thanks to Pacanteur and uh, he's going to have quite some defenses as well. First, let's hope for a very good roll. There is this. Five criticals, making another critical. And that's going to be quite good. Let's have a look for the SDV. That's going to be minus five, good defense roll. These nice little orc, <laughs> these nice orcas, uh, the three hole points and a critical, which was again Sturgenium Flare, which means catastrophic explosions, which means that this Chevalier is dead and well dead. I'm quite happy because both the Suza with their Rebelliel and the Chevalier with their uh, protected gun crews uh, mean that when they're crippled, they don't lose firepower. So that's quite annoying and I need to finish them off, which is what I started to do with the Chevalier, the first mass two that I sing from this game. Yay! Last activation for the second turn for the Alliance, the Virginia obliterated with its two it lances, the uh, Toronto with a double citadel and everything. Like It's really dead. And its rockets did uh, two hull points of damage on the Saxon, almost killing it. But luckily, the Saxon has an AD of four from the start, plus one for its friend. So it was quite resilient against rockets. And for Valentin. Ah, uh, yeah, important to say it, to put the tokens. One of our friends really insists that we put activation tokens. Okay, that is going to be it for the Alliance. And now we have the big Daddy Saskatchewan that is coming. Okay, so I deployed the Saskatchewan. I deployed it in a very like British Canadian way, which means as far away from the enemy as possible. And we are going to use, <laughs> it's a very long range, longbow torpedoes on the Saratoga at 40 inches and all the aircrafts of the Saskatchewan because yes, the special version of the protector can send SRS token and shoot at full potential when it arrives. All of those are going on this Chevalier. I hope to hurt it very much. And all the torpedoes are going on the Saratoga. Let's have a look what happens after all of this. Without much surprise, this Saratoga has been destroyed by the torpedoes like a few times over. And the flag barrage of the Virginia destroyed two SRS tokens. So there's only uh, nine of them right now. Uh, the ADV did not manage to kill any further. So that is going to be 27 dices on a Chevalier with, uh, <laughs> with uh, overwhelming firepower. So we're rolling blank and uh, piercing and all of these fun stuff. Uh, let, we will have a look after we roll the dices, what happened? Yeah, well, when you don't have luck with the dices, uh, this is a result of the air attack. Luckily, I can reroll the few blanks, but if I make a point of damage, that's already going to be a lot. Okay. 
Well, after this disappointing roll, I still managed with a few additional explosives to do 18 hits. So three whole points and two criticals, including an explosion. So I did manage barely to cripple one of the Chevalier. It's a fine result, but I expected a lot more from this activation from all the SRS tokens. Eh, fine. I do though have the initiative for the third turn. And of course, I'm going to activate first the uh, Saskatchewan because, well, I don't have much more heavy firepower anymore. So this is what I will activate, and I barely have like a few aircraft and submarines around. I need to wither him down before he can shoot down all my very weak units that are here now. The Saskatchewan destroyed one of the Chevaliers that was already crippled with its torpedo salvo. Very good. And I used the card that I had since turn one to make a double activation. And those little orcas, before they die, are going to send all their torpedoes on the Chevalier. Uh, I think that's going to be the last thing they ever do. But if I could put him crippled, that would be wonderful. The Chevalier activated. Uh, he put two hit lances on an orca, obviously killing it. And one torpedo salvo. He made a very good roll, 11 hits with five dices, quite good. Uh, and I used a card to count uh, explosives as heavy counters, and it was exactly what I needed. I went down to nine hits allowing it to lose only two whole points, but saving it from being killed outright. Quite happy with this. And, and, and this card. Oh no. Uh, ah yeah, he gained some uh, victory points. Okay. Let's go for the crown. The two Saxons went in the rear here doing in total one whole point to the Chevalier. And the Ecuyer activated within 12 inches from the center and they got a Sturginium Flare which means that every single model from the unit will get a Sturgeonium Flare, losing one hull point and drifting one uh, forward, which is not a big deal. But for models that have two hull points each, <laughs> it is quite annoying for them. Quite happy if this happened. The Thunder is coming to help the British. And after this, we just made all the rolls. We have this Tintagel that did nothing almost from the entire game, and he just woke up. He went to this position with its Light broadside, it killed one Ecuyer. With the rocket, it killed the second Ecuyer. And with its torpedo, it finished crippling the Chevalier. That is a lot of work from a single Tintagel. I'm starting to understand why they cost so much. They are quite fast and they can do the job. Uh, now it's going to be the last activation of the Alliance. And of course, it's going to be Big Daddy Virginia. Or Big Mommy Virginia, maybe. It's a woman's name. The Virginia is angry. She's going to make 13 dices with broadside and everything on him. He's dead, basically. There's going to be two rockets on the damaged Saxon and two heat lances on the undamaged Saxon. And finally, the Terminator assault are going after the Tintagel for an epic air battle. First, we're going to do the broadside. Uh, not dead yet. Okay. He is dead, this poor orca. The hit lances did only one point of damage on the Saxon all the way there in the back. Uh, the rockets finished off though the second Saxon and now we are going to have a look at the air battle, the boarding of the Tintagel by the Talon Autogyrus, like the Terminator Assault. It's gonna be 15 dices in offense and 15 dices in defense. So first, the boarding. Ooh. That is a good roll. Three explosives. Making another explosive. And that is quite efficient. So 18 hits of the boarding of the Tintagel. It has 15 dice in defense. All the battery gunner trying to hold. And that is not going to be much. It's going to be seven. So that is going to be more than 10 differences. It's going to be a catastrophic uh, damage. Let's see. I'm not sure if the mass ones can die outright from a boarding. We'll have a look. Yeah, we checked, so there is no one-shotting the Citadel through this, but already two catastrophic explosion is four whole points, uh, and the Tintagel has four whole points in total. It is going down. That is it for the third turn. We will do the air assault now. Hopefully it will be a little bit better. And then we're going to start the fourth turn. Let's first see if we can sink this Chevalier. The flag barrage of the Virginia destroyed three tokens 
of the <laughs> that were trying to go after the Chevalier. There is not much at all. I have six dices. Uh, I'm hoping to make at least uh, six points for the Citadel. And that is not enough. I will use a card to reroll uh, everything. Which, yeah, I will reroll everything because I really would like to cripple this guy. Let's see if I can succeed. Okay. Thank you, aircrafts. First activation, this Saskatchewan went here to shoot everything at the Chevalier, hoping to finish him off. And I have eight tokens uh, because I have plus three thanks to Snowbird Strike. We are on turn four. And I put everything on the Virginia. Let's now have a look at this torpedo attack. It's now going to be 29 dices. And here it comes, 29 dices. And we have a huge 10 explosives, making another one explosive. And that is going to be it. He has minus two in defense. I think he's dead. The Virginia turned around like 180 degrees. And funny thing, he's going to shoot everything on the Saxon all the way there, because he wants to secure the fact of sinking it. That is going to be a lot of dices. We're pretty sure he's gonna die, but uh, it's not that many. Uh, he's obscured, but it's devastating. And yeah, it is nine hits. It is barely enough to destroy the Saxon. Now it's gonna be time for the airplanes. The little card is because he gained four victory points with this because the deck was not very well mixed and he has all the cards saying like, yeah, if you sh destroy a mass one unit, you gain points. So he goes in the front with the points quite far with this. And I really need to destroy the Virginia. Okay, I had 18 dices. And thanks to a very hot roll with a lot, like, and I mean a lot of explosives, this is what we get. The Virginia might be tough, but I think it's still gonna have a bad day. After this very good roll, it was four hull points, like, like three hull points and a critical. The critical was the Sturgenium Flare making four. And then I rolled a second critical because of piercing. It was another Sturgenium Flare. So six hull points lost for the Virginia with this air attack. Very good, Air Raid. Okay, so we have finished turn five. We played without filming. It was quite intense. In the end, Steve won uh, through the points, so it's a victory of the Alliance, but we wanted to see if we play turn six, what would happen. Through the auto uh, Giro's boarding, the protector is going down, he's sinking, and I managed with the last air attack to make the Virginia go to one hull point. I have two criticals. I need to make him lose one hull point from this. And he's going down. Let's have a look. No! <laughs> it's not going to be enough. He goes to the black level of disorder. But he stays alive. That, that is it for this battle victory of the Alliance. The ruthless battle saw the destruction of the near totality of both fleets. Every single Canadian ship of Task Force Mordred was sunk but at the cost of nearly the entire Alliance force. At the end of the day, the burning Virginia class of Sousa Admiral Salazar was the last ship not beneath the Azure waves. Two damage to push onto the under construction outpost S1 of Task Force Mordred, the Virginia retreated, regrouped with the logistical support Alliance ships that stayed away from the battle, and established a beachhead at the aptly named Fort Victoire. Meanwhile, without any combat ship, to protect Outpost S1, Task Force Mordred sent a desperate plea for help across the vortex, hoping their heavy gun batteries installed at the outpost would hold long enough for reinforcements to arrive. After months of relative peace in the archipelago Alpha, the appearance of Omega and the necessity to send a constant stream of ships there would be sure to destabilize the balance of power on both sides of the vortex. And now let's talk about how we, what we thought of the game, and make the debriefing. So this is it for today's battle report. Victory for the Alliance, for the French and the South Americans. That is how it is. Uh, it's a good victory. It was a very tight and close match all the way until the end. And it finishes, like if we go all the way to the sixth turn, 
it finishes like at the last whole point and uh, it's, it was very very interesting. Uh, Steve, what did you think of today's game? Today, uh, it was a, a very exciting uh, battle and a very tough moment uh, and uh, there is some tricks and uh, some moments very intense but uh, very cinematic, very heroic uh, for your side to my yeah. side There were some good actions from the time, yeah Blowing mind mm -hmm. Very, very, very good moment with you mm -hmm. and uh, this yeah. game Always having a good time when we oh, yeah. play this game, that is very true uh, for me, I must admit, I'm very uh, happily surprised of the Saskatchewan, which we know that big submarines going to the back line of the enemy with torpedoes are always annoying. We've known this for the Ukrainians and now with the Canadians. Uh, and this one has aircraft as well. Uh, so for sure MVP here. The aircrafts of the Crown, like the Saxon and the Tintagel, were good, but uh, probably you need larger squadrons to start to have an impact because here, well, they are fragile, but they don't do much. Uh, a little bit disappointed of the Toronto and the, the Halifax. Uh, the Halifax didn't do much because there was not many shields around, and even the Torontos, like, well, maybe I was not against the right fleet, but they didn't do anything almost uh, at all. So, well, uh, sad for this, but the Crown has other good ships, especially the British ones, which are very good. Uh, what I would have changed, well, in this list, most our lists were not optimized. One thing I was very surprised is the Virginia, with all these escorts, like, unkillable, as you've seen, I've shot a lot of torpedoes, turn after turn after turn. We did not count, but, uh, hundreds? Yeah, hundreds of dices, for sure, uh, between everything, and he has flag barrage 10, all the escorts. Uh, we were lucky he did put the Springfield Corvettes attached, but if he did that, it would have been just insane. So, this thing is invulnerable, basically, to torpedoes, to aircraft, to uh, rockets. And with, uh, with its high level, even gun batteries, which I didn't have at all, uh, would have a hard time. Uh, I think if you put a shroud on it, like in the Union, like you don't take the rear gene and you take the monitor or this kind of thing, and you put a shroud, this thing is unkillable, basically. It's probably the toughest ship in the game right now. In this version uh, of the Columbia, and, uh, you switch the uh, gun batteries yeah. with a shroud. Yeah, for the Union. Uh, you, you, yeah. you don't have Terminator assault, but, yeah. but you just go in the middle. You go in the middle, you make assault, you make broadsides, and that's it. You don't need more, and it's going to be a huge threat. So, uh, this is going to be it for today. We will see the next uh, battle report. Maybe not with the Crown. We're supposed to have the Avalon today, but unfortunately, just as I was packing to bring it, uh, it got a little bit broken. It's too heavy, and the support for the Avalon just collapsed. It was too heavy. So I need to find a solution. But yeah, we were afraid that the Avalon would be too heavy because it's a big chunky boy of resin and it is too, a bit too heavy, unfortunately. I will try to find uh, how to repair it. Uh, this is going to be it for today. Uh, we will first uh, hope that you enjoyed. And uh, until the next time, remember to take care of yourself and those around you and to keep spreading the love. Bye.